great innovation stories make change possible. Each week on the Innovation Storytellers podcast, I invite innovation leaders to share how they overcame the obstacles to introduce breakthrough ideas to the world through the power of story. I'm featuring guests from Tesla, TD Ameritrade, Corning, Cisco, Bloomberg, and so many more. Listen in to learn how you can tell a more effective innovation story and change the future for the better. Hi, everybody. It's Susan Linder. I'm your host of Innovation Storytellers. Welcome to another episode here in season two. I'm really excited about our guests that we have today. Before we dive in, though, I just want you to prepare yourselves. You're going to hear some stories that you won't be able to hear anywhere else. This is a very dynamic husband and wife duo who have lived lives that I think many of us wish we could have led and perhaps maybe will be inspired to live them still. So I'm so grateful that you're coming back for another season of Innovation Storytellers, and I think you'll find today's episode particularly riveting. So let me first introduce my guests today. Dr. Eric Hasseltine is the named inventor on more than 60 Four patents. Just think about that lifelong legacy for a moment. He's also the former executive vice president at Walt Disney Imagineering, the place where so many incredible dreams and great magic that we've all experienced as kids and grownups has come to life. He's also served, imagine this transition now, as the director of research at the NSA and the director of science and technology for the U.S. intelligence community. And he is today the chairman of the board of U.S. Technology Leadership Council. He has authored four books on innovation, science, and technology, including the espionage techno thriller, The Spy in Moscow Station, and his most recent book with his co-author, Dr. Chris Gilbert, Riding the Monster, Five Ways to Innovate Inside Bureaucracies. I can't imagine a more challenging place to innovate, but we're going to get to it. Now, having Dr. Hasseltine on alone would be a coup in any podcaster's dream, but I'm also joined by Chris McGilbert, who is an MD, PhD, served as a physician, writer, and speaker, and has pioneered innovative techniques in holistic and integrative medicine, described in her book on mind-body medicine, The Listening Cure. Dr. Gilbert, who has had private practice in France and California, has also served with Doctors Without Borders in Africa and in Asia, and is also a certified specialist in hyperbaric medicine and regularly serves as medical consultant to TV and movies all around the world. So without further ado, let me welcome Eric and Chris to my podcast today. Welcome to Innovation Storytellers. Thanks. Great to be here. Yeah, thank you for having us. Did I get it all? Because you've lived pretty exceptional lives, people. Did I get it all in there or am I missing something? Well, you're missing some things, but you're going to have to stay missing them. (laughs) (laughs) I would have done so many things. It would be really hard to list them all. So those are just the major ones. Right. And if you told me you'd have to kill me, is that the kind of information that's missing? Fantastic. The way it works is I have to tell you, she kills it. Yes. <laughs> well, she's got all the cookie chemicals as a doctor, exactly. right? She gets all yes. those on her fingertips. Absolutely. Okay. I don't want to scare my audience away too much, but Eric, I really want to start with you because for so many of us, Disney is the place that we first encounter innovation when we experience it as magic as kids. And thinking of the work in Imagineering, can you just describe what that's like for so many of us who think about Disney and innovating and in some way is really innovating in things we don't even get to see, right? We just feel it as the experience when we come to the parks, the films, the merch, whatever it may be. And even the things that are just operationally bound to creating magic for employees and stakeholders. Mm -hmm. What's that, what's that experience like? Well, curiously, when we innovate, which is to create things that change in a big way, we start with things that never change, which is the human heart. Hmm. Our goal is always to put an emotion, a positive one, in someone's heart, particularly families and kids. And the number one emotion that we try to instill is hope. Hmm. And uh, that never changes. Is uh, hope springs eternal in the human heart. 
So I'm going to tell you a story about how we did what we did at Imagineering and Innovation. When you get to Disney Imagineering, all you hear is stories about Walt, because that tells you the culture of the company and the way to create experiences of the heart. Mm -hmm. And so when Disneyland first opened, guests were trampling the grass and his groundskeepers came to Walt with all these ideas for cool looking fences to prevent that. And he said, don't, I want you to watch where they walk and then pave it to make it easier. Mm -hmm. And when you think about everything that we did at Imagineering, it was paving easier paths to an experience of hope and excitement. So and you're talking so about that, user experience, like right from the get-go. I mean, so many of our listeners are innovators in the space of customer experience, user experience. I mean, that's embedded, what you're saying, in innovation at Disney. Yeah, this is actually going to be something we talk about later is the major theme of our book, hmm. which is innovation is really not about introducing new technology, new gadget, new whatever. It's about changing people's behavior. Right. And how do you do that? And that people never change. So the principles we talk about grow out of the unchanging human heart and how you deal with it. And that's really the five stories that we tell in our book, Writing the Monster, are all about how you do that. I'll say one more thing about Disney is we start with a very informal process, a brainstorming process. But we always start, we take our room where we do the brainstorming and we paste pictures of families and kids that we're looking to make have fun because we usually target a specific demographic. Like, for example, if you're doing something in Florida and Walt Disney World, we would target Brazilians and Europeans because that's who comes to Walt Disney World. Hmm. And we show their lives and what's going on in their lives so that we can craft an experience that is fun and exciting and puts hope in their heart. Brazilians and Europeans. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, it most is. of the, the people who come, the big money makers for Disney in Florida are Europeans and Central and South Americans. Amazing. Amazing. And so, Chris, I'm really interested in this, the take on similar to what Eric was saying about people don't change, but we do have psychology and neuroscience. And we know now about neuroplasticity. As we move the discussion from the heart to the head, what do innovators need to know about how we actually create behavior change using neuroscience and using our bodies, perhaps in a way that we didn't think about before? A lot of things are in the head. What happens you know, I was listening to stories of patients and patients, when they describe their symptoms, they describe, oh, it started at a certain day when I was doing blah. And we noticed that usually there is a repressed emotion just before the symptom starts. And that's very consistent with a lot of, a lot of patients, a lot of people. So after noticing that, I conferred with other physicians. Other physicians would say the same thing. People mm. describe an example is when a woman, a 56 year old woman of my patients, would get sick every time her mother would come and visit. She would get terrible bronchitis. And that was because there was a repressed anger at the same time when her mother was coming to visit. So they were all related. So, whatever symptom the people have, what is the emotion and what's that's what our people can look for and to address the different symptoms and new treatments address whatever emotion is coming with it and that started the book our book the listening cure with the techniques of coupling the two treating the symptom but also treating the emotion behind the symptom yeah, if i could add a little bit because i did uh, co-author a yes. small part of the listening cure and talking about the brain and how the brain gets involved in what Dr. Gilbert just said. And one of the ways our brain works is to focus on the here and now so we can survive. We automatically repress things that would distract us from here and now survival. And one of the things that distract us is unpleasant feelings like fear and anger. So Freud talked about this, but we do repress these things so we don't know they're there. And we can't get rid of things we don't know that we have. Mm -hmm. And so that causes illness in the body because the stress is there and it hurts the body. So mm -hmm. where Dr. Gilbert innovated and described in the book, The Listening Cure, is her big innovation was instead of just treating the symptoms that are physical, she treated the deep cause 
which was emotional. And that was the innovation of her work. And it grew out of the stories that her patients told her about what happened before they got sick. Yeah. This is also the issue with the market, right? When we're trying to innovate and we're seeing on the surface what looks like a market opportunity. But if we don't ask the question, and it's the one I ask most of the innovators that I work with is, where is the patient bleeding from the neck, right? Where's the obvious pain? And then what is the pain that we don't know? What is the consequence of that pain? Because then when we have an innovation, we're really solving from the bottom up. And this is a question that we need to ask before we ever tell a story is, are we really listening to the customer? Are we really getting in deep? Which is why I wanted to have you on the show is, what is the lesson for the innovator on how to do the deep listening when you're talking about trying to ascertain the market need, when you're trying to ascertain whether it's an incremental innovation or a moonshot, how do we ascertain the pain or the underlying even desire, right? It doesn't always have to be a negative emotion that's repressed. It could be a hope. It could be a wish like you were talking about, Eric. Yeah. So let's uh, answer that by talking about one of the characters in our book, Writing the Monster. Uh, He is a chapter here on a guy named Gary Soika, who understands that innovation happens when you get people together and they tell stories. And the most important thing is how you get them together and how the truth emerges in those stories. Mm. Because the core need for innovation is you can't innovate and solve a real problem if you don't know the truth. And the truth gets covered up. And I'll give you an example. This character, Gary Soike, creates supper clubs in Washington, D.C. for intelligence mostly, but also defense people. And one of them is called the Cockroaches. And we won't go into what that is. I'm the chairman of the board of another one, the U.S. Technology Leadership Council, which is all about getting people to get together trust each other, respect each other, get drunk with each other, eat good food together, and tell each other the truth. So it's mid-level government people plus mid-level technology people mixed together with, and there are leaders and there are speakers that come. Congressmen, senators. Congressmen, senators. So this is a complete mix of different people, and they all tell stories. So let, let me tell you a story that happened. And it illustrates the major theme of our book, which is innovation happens through, happens through behavior change. Behavior change happens through relationships of trust that get people to risk. And so I was uh, having a beer with an individual who was responsible for targeting high value terrorists, big names that most people would recognize. And we were talking, we'd worked together for several years and we're having like our third or fourth beer over in the corner. And he says to me, Eric, he whispers, he says, you know, about a third of the time we go after an objective, meaning they're going to go do an operation against a particular target, like an Al-Qaeda senior, for example. He said about a third of the time we find warm tea, but we don't find our target. Mm. They disappear minutes before we get there. Mm. And so that's a big problem. Right. And so I said, because I've just been working on a related issue, I said, you know, maybe it's because of X. And he goes, oh. So I went downrange, I went to the Middle East where they were doing this work and I helped with my team to do X and it really cut down on the problem. And the moral of that story is that over beer in an informal setting with camaraderie and we had a relationship of trust, which was informal, the truth came out Mm because most people will not tell you the truth when it truth would make them look bad. Right. When the consequences are too grave. That's right. So Storytelling is all important, but before the story can happen, there has to be a relationship. And that relationship shouldn't be formal, really. The relationship would be informal because there is a term we call psychological safety. Mm -hmm. People will not risk when they don't feel safe. That's right. And so the theme of our book is that in order to innovate, you have to establish that trust. You have to establish that informal relationship so that A, people will trust if they change their behavior, they're not going to be hurt. And B, they will tell you the truth. Because every innovation I've ever worked about really was a search for the truth. So the surface, whereas there's the need for the innovation, and then there is what's underground. Underground, there are relationships between people. There are ties, there are financial ties between people. There are friendships that we don't know about, but 
in those informal meetings, you will learn about those informal ties. We learn about all those financial, everything that's happening underground. And that is the key to the success of the innovation. It's not what's on the surface. It's what is deep that's underground. That's right. And yeah. uh, we call those invisible relationships. Yeah. So I wanted to talk with you a little bit about that because these invisible relationships are the ones that we don't get from straight market research, right? Oftentimes we send out a team of market researchers. They go and survey people in a sterile setting in a mall. They show them the new advertising. They show them the new product or service. And they say, tell us what you think. Would you use it? Who would use it? Who would you tell about this, et cetera? But it's these invisible relationships that I think our audience would love to learn how to mine for. How do we even ask the questions about invisible relationships that would help get us farther faster? Well, the problem with invisible relationships is they resist being exposed. Mm. Like if you went to a large corporation, you knew because like all organizations, they're going to have a rebel alliance, a series of tribes and mafias that cut across organizational boundaries where the real power structure of that organization bears no relationship at all to the form of chart. chart right? <laughs> yeah. And if oh. they say, hey, we want you to reveal all the people you hang out with and do backroom deals with where you scratch each other's back, despite what management wants, we want you to reveal all that. Mm. Well, it would never happen. So right. you have to be a made guy in the mafia. And I'll tell you a story, a story about a story that ended up with a big innovation when it comes to saving lives from roadside bombs. When I was at NSA, I wanted to go to Iraq and Afghanistan to work on the roadside bomb problem because that was the major thing that was killing and maiming our troops and harming our mission. And they'd say, well, you're like a three-star general. You can't go there. You're going to get killed and we can't afford to lose you. And I said, look, you know, let me tell you a story. When I first got promoted to a similar rank at Disney, I was a VP. We had a program where we took new executives and we put them as walk around characters in theme parks so they could learn what it was like to deal with so they dressed up like Mickey Mouse and Donald Duck and yeah. <laughs> I was Br'er Bear because I was pretty big <laughs> and my script was to get, grab uptight looking baddies with short haircuts either military or cops with little girls and without their permission you know start dancing with them and their little girls would scream with delight and I understood something then that I've been at Disney for five years but I realized I didn't understand entertainment because I'd never entertained a little girl or their family. And so what I took away from that experience was if you don't do it, you don't understand it. That's right. Yeah. And so I went to my boss, General Hayden, who later became head of CIA, but then he was running NSA. I said, General Hayden, I told him that story. I said, you got to let me go there so that I can dance with the daddy and see what the little girls are going to do. He understood me. And he said, okay. So I went there seven times. And one of the times I went there, I was riding on what we call the Highway of Death, Route Irish, from the airport to the green zone. And I said to this soldier who was in the front seat, I said that, hey, what if we could have a device that would detect the roadside bomb far back of where it could hurt you and it'd tell you roughly where it was? He said, oh, my God, that would be great. But a sergeant sitting next to him got real stiff and said, well, that's the dumbest effing idea I ever heard. And I said, why? He said, because... You're going to stop, and that's where they're going to put the bomb. They'll put the trigger so you'll detect it, but they'll put the actual bomb where you stop, and you're going to get us all killed. We were spending billions of dollars on that because no one had actually gone there and done it and talked to the people. So because I had taken that route many times with them and bad things had happened to us together, we bonded. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't a formal bond. It was like the bond you get when you're both getting shot at, Right. And so there was trust. So what happened was the truth. Mm. It got to the truth. And like two months later, because of what he told me, we actually did something very different that he asked us to do that cut the casualties in half wow. in just two months. And so that was innovation through the power of storytelling. And it all started in a Disney theme park, but it ended up on the battlefields of Iraq. Yeah. You know, this is very similar to how I came to my realization about innovation storytelling. It was, how are we going to get sex workers in a brothel in Thailand to use condoms eight times a night? And we realized the device itself wasn't going to change, right? That had been with us for thousands of years in human history, but the need was to change the narrative around why we use it and how we use it and how life gets better in order to get people to use that. And 
Dr. Gilbert, I'm sure that you have some examples of this in the medical community as well. Yeah, absolutely. But I wanted to say about Eric's story is that what's very important is to spend time with the people. If you want to do an innovation, invest the time to know all the people, all the players, but also to go down range. Time is invaluable because it takes time to get the trust of the people. And there are stories like this because innovations in medicine to trust the people. The, a big innovation was Viagra, for example. Mm-hmm. And in uh, 1989, the Pfizer was doing trials on a certain molecule called sildenafil. And that was the purpose was to treat chest pain related to heart disease. So they were doing a phase one trial and they had the little molecule that they had created. And on phase one, they said it turned out that it was not working at all for chest pain related to heart disease. But when they got, they wanted their pills back, the people did not want to get their pills back. They said, no, 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 we want to keep them. They go, why do you want to get, especially men, wanted to keep their pills. Why? And by going down rage and, and interviewing those people, asking them why, then they learned that there were that little pill, little blue pill, was giving them spectacular erections. Side effects. Uh-huh. <laughs> And uh, even several days after s- stopping the pill, the erections were still sp- spectacular. And then they said, oh, then let's just redirect this and uh, get the FDA approval for erectile disorder, which they got. And then in 2008, that little teeny pill got close to $2 billion in sale in just one year. Spectacular invention, spectacular innovation. But had then they got downrange to see, to interview the people and see exactly what happened. They would not have known that. Hey, it's Susan here. Like what you're hearing so far? Make sure you never miss an episode by clicking the subscribe button now. This podcast is made possible by listeners like you. So thank you for being here. Whether it's your first time or you're 10 episodes deep, if you want to learn more about me and the work that I do with innovation leaders, head over to susanlindner.com for more information. I'm always open to a conversation to learn how I might better support you. But for right now, let's get back to the show. Yeah, and I think to build on the theme of storytelling, they first heard about these stories of, hey, well, how come we're not getting the medication back? They heard these stories and then they went down to investigate. And again, this is a quick question of because they spent time with them, as Dr. Gilbert said, they got the trust and the guys wouldn't have told them the truth about really why they kept it if they didn't trust them. And that's more of a relationship. So that's, again, the theme of our book, that innovation really is about changing people's behavior and doing it through trust and trust through relationships. Yeah. We often talk on this show about how senior leaders, um, especially chief innovation officers, can create an environment where people can listen, take time, and also fail. And I'm curious what you think about getting CEO buy-in, getting senior level buy-in to an innovation, maybe when you've done the hard work of the listening, when you've done the prototyping and so forth, getting that CEO to see things differently, perhaps in a way that they haven't before, because they don't have the time and they're busy focusing on other things like shareholder value, as opposed to what's going on in the field. How do you get that CEO buy-in and Get in and get out of the way. (laughs) Well, honestly, having been a consultant for many years to CEOs, the answer is you don't. If the CEO doesn't have a fire in their belly like A.G. Lathley or Lou Gerstner or someone like that, or the current CEO of Kroger, it's never going to happen. Because most CEOs are focused on Wall Street and their share price here and now. Right. But there is a way to do it. But it's Indirect. And that's, again, the theme of our book. Most people think if I only tell the CEO, this is a great product, look how great it is, look at the numbers, look how much we can sell, the what and the how much is going to sell it. And that's completely not true. Mm-hmm. What will sell it is the who. Who does the CEO listen to and trust informally? Who's in his or her mafia? So if you want to get a message to the CEO, you never go direct. You go around and you find out who they listen to, who they have beers with, and you convince them 
because that kind of person talking to the CEO, singing your virtues, is infinitely more powerful than you going up and presenting an incredible PowerPoint with all the right numbers. So you need your own publicist is what you're saying. Well, no, what you your need- Your ideas effectively. <laughs> no, you have to understand the organization as it is, not the way it's supposed to be. Ah. And how decisions really get made, not the way they're supposed to get made. And the way they really get made at the CEO level is a CEO is a generalist, or maybe they're in finance or marketing or something. So they're good judges of people, but how do they know like cyber? How do they know when their CIO comes to them and says, we got to spend a billion dollars on this new operating system? They don't know. They have to be judges of people. Mm. And what they're judging is, do I respect and trust this person? So basically CEOs listen to their mafia. So you got to get the message through the mafia. Like I did this at Disney. There was a guy, a senior exec I had to get to who was head of a Disney channel. And I did it through a guy who went to the same gym that he did. While they were lifting weights together, he started saying things that I wanted him to say. And that got us where we needed to go. That's the real world. And again, it just comes down to relationships, relationships, relationships. And time. Invest the time to know the company because every company is different. Every CEO is different. Invest the time to know all the different players, to be aware of who are the invisible players. It takes the time to get the trust to all those people. Yeah. That's what the Middle East is doing or what China is doing by doing things very slowly to get the trust of people, right? Yeah. And I think the bottom line message, again, from our book is people focus on the what, particularly engineers and scientists. That's not where the results are. It's on focusing on the who. You've got to get the what right. You have to have a product that's good. But without the who, you're not going anywhere. Yeah. Or it's going to be a much harder slog. Well, this is the valley of death. You've heard Mm -hmm. about it. And we, uh, people who run R&D labs, this is the thing that keeps us up at night. Our people invent great things. And they crash and burn in the valley of death. And what doesn't bridge the valley of death is a bridge of trust built on informal relationships. Mm -hmm. That's the real world. Innovation walks on two legs across a bridge of trust. Yeah. So let's talk about when innovation fails. So I'm curious if they're in your extensive backgrounds, if you've innovated anything worthwhile, you failed at innovating something worthwhile too. Tell us about an experience of when something, maybe it's at Disney, didn't work out right and how you came back from that. Well, the current CEO of Disney, Bob Chapek, had asked me about 10 years ago to start a new group to look at a completely new kind of play based on internet connected toys. So I started that group and we came out with a new toy very shortly called the Repulsor Blaster. It was an Iron Man thing you wore on your wrist. And uh, Dr. Chris, you uh, were the earliest. Yeah, you tried it on me when we were dating at that time. And he said, you were dating and you tried out a toy called the Repulsor. You must have been incredibly confident in your ability to hold that together, Eric. (laughs) Yeah, well, she thought I was going to electrocute her. It it didn't help that this thing had little haptic transducers that made you think. Covered me with little haptic stress juices and says, you're not going to feel any. You're just going to feel a little electric shock. (laughs) Yeah. So we wanted to make it feel like you'd actually been shot through. And it was creepy. But every mother wants for a little kid, right? It's every child to know what the feeling of being shot feels like because we try to protect them from that experience their entire lives. Well, actually, at Disney Imagineering, our motto was fear minus death equals fun. And that was kind of the point. (laughs) Of the Repulsor Blaster. Well, anyhow, we got it to market and some related toys, and it won every award a toy could win for innovation. And in the marketplace, it failed spectacularly. And the reason was we had to change a whole series of people's behavior. Like, take marketing. They had to learn that you don't market this with the standard campaign. You have to put demo models out in a thousand malls to get people to experience. It was so novel. It was so different. People couldn't understand what it was. I mean, that's why it won all the awards. It was just radically different than anything that had ever been done. But that was its weakness. And so marketing didn't understand it. The retailers didn't understand it. They put it in the toy aisle when it should have been in the consumer electronics aisle. And the pricing, it looked just like just this inert plastic repulsor blaster that costs one fourth as much. So mom's on the toy aisle 
She's not going to change her behavior and say, well, I'm going to pay four times as much for something. The kid's only going to use a week or two. Right. So if I can get a Nerf gun. <laughs> yeah. So that's, that's typically how things fail. We did learn from that, though. Mm. And we completely came up with a different concept, which was a real lightsaber. Because that's what our consumers told us when we started working Star Wars. And we came to market with an augmented reality lightsaber that to this day is the best-selling consumer augmented reality headset in the world by far. And again, uh, Dr. Gilbert here was the poor guinea pig who had to uh, experience it. So th there's two points of that, is that our failure grew out of our inability to change human behavior, not in our inability to innovate. And secondly, that failure taught us how to later succeed. And behind every success, you're going to find a string of failures that made people learn what it was going to take to succeed. Yeah. And so, to your point about changing human behavior, though, we didn't have the right story to accompany that product, right? That would help people to change their behavior. The bridge, I often find when I ask innovators on the show about the failure is the bridge is the story. Like if we don't tell the right story that connects us, right, we can't get that into our imagination to even begin that process. What do you think, Dr. Chris? Yeah, and also the, with the Repulsive Blaster, it was not easy to use by the consumer. Like we uh -huh. got to finish one of the finished product at home and we couldn't, just the two of us, we couldn't figure out how to put all the batteries in there. It was Ooh. very complicated and it needed a lot of batteries. So I'm not sure that they had the finished product and they tried it themselves once it was on the shelves. So I think it's very important when it's once we think it's finished to want to use it ourselves, the inventors, and make sure it's easy to use and we want to use it. Yeah. And so about the storytelling bridge. Yeah. We took some of those same consumers who had those problems. And we bring them into this room of the future that we built. And you use what we started off doing was formal focus group testing, kind of yep. like science experiments. But what we learned later, and it was one of the things that motivated our book, is that we found out that when we created long breaks between the formal information gathering and just simply hung out with the parents and the kids, and you know, brought them refreshments and snacks and just sat there talking, say, hey, well, our technical team has to go do something. Well, our technical team didn't have to do anything. We just wanted to create an excuse for informality. And during one of those sessions, Mike Goslin, who was the creative lead of the group at the time, and he ended up leading the group completely, he just sat around and he was having coffee with the father. And the father is looking at all this stuff. And he says, you know, Mike, this is all great. You know what I really want? And my kid really wants. And what I fantasized since the 1970s that I had to have was a real lightsaber that I could use and a real laser would come out and I could destroy real things. That's what I really want. And I was sitting there listening to that. And I looked at Mike and Mike looked at me and we went off and we said, I think I could do that with superimposing a hologram of the lightsaber laser on a physical hilt. And so we came back and we said, well, hey, would you be willing to come back? We got something to show you in about a month. And we did. It worked. And then the rest is history. Yeah. But it all started with a little bit of folklore and storytelling during these informal. Because if you think about it in a corporate setting, everything is organized. So if you try to tell stories in a formal meeting, people are going to go, you're distracting. And this happened to me. I mean, I got criticized a lot for just, oh, he's rattling on again about stories. Let's get to the point. Well, as you like to say, the point actually is the stories. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think slowly we're trying to find this out. So I'm just looking at our time and I want to make sure that I just love this. I cannot wait till we will see our own military using lightsabers on the battlefield. That would be a <laughs> phenomenal shift in military strategy, I think. But I think it'll be recruiting will become phenomenally easier as a result of, of that taking place. But I have a couple of questions for the both of you. If I can put you on our innovation storytellers hot seat. How does that sound? Sounds good. Okay. So greatest innovation in human history. What do you think is the greatest innovation in human history? I would say penicillin. Penicillin. Antibiotics. Yeah. I think mm -hmm. it's had the single biggest positive effect on human lives in all history. Hmm. Antibiotics. I'm very optimistic with the mRNA, the messenger RNA technique. I think the potential is huge and that's in the future. So we don't know yet, but if we could get rid of 
all the chemotherapy for cancer and replace it with injections of mRNA. If we could get rid of the people that don't have enough insulin, diabetes, get rid of all those medications and do the mRNA. I mean, that as a potential of being huge. So I'm very optimistic about that. Otherwise, I do agree it's antibiotics. Yeah. What innovation team, if you could have been on any team, would you have liked to have been on to create the coolest innovations? What would you... Would you... With Watson and Crick and the way that they came up with what the structure of DNA is. And because they were playful. You know, what they did is they built models like little tinker toy. Literally, they were tinker toy models. And people think, oh, they were these great genius, these physical chemists and this. You know what they really did? They put these tinker toys together and they sat in a corner and they just kind of put together to see what fits. And then one day they created these helixes and they fit together and they go, there it is. Who knew? Right. So I would have loved to be on that team. Yeah. And people are doing that with Legos now. There's a whole movement to use Legos to figure out new innovative products as well. Yeah. Yeah. For me, I love the concept. Again, I'm all in the future. I love the concept of flying cars and drones. So if I could have been on one of those teams creating the drones and and the the possible future of delivering packages via drones and maybe taxis to getting you from one place to another place via flying car. I mean, I think this is the most fun of all. And what's the innovation that you wish you could have that maybe hasn't been invented yet? So I hear the flying car, right? I think you might have already answered that, Dr. Gilbert. But I'm curious, what's missing? What's the innovation that we all wish we had? Well, I write a lot of code, computer programs doing AI work. And what I want in coding is what we call the DWIM statement. Do what I mean. So it doesn't matter how you type it is somehow the thing knows what you want to do and magically it does it. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be nice? I would love that for parenting as well. Do what I mean. mean. (laughs) If you could please just read my mind, that would be brilliant. (laughs) And for me, I want to see what's in the moon, on the moon, on Mars, on the different planets and see what kind of material we could use, new material, new cells, new organisms on, on all this. And how can we use them? in a different way. I think there is so much we don't know and the potential. I want to be on those teams. Yeah. Great. So I want to thank you both for being on our show. Innovation Storytellers is the place where innovators come to talk about the stories that they tell to get their innovations approved. I would love to make sure that our audience can find both of you. And I want to remind you to pick up a copy wherever you like to buy a book of Riding the Monster, Five Ways to Innovate Inside Bureaucracies. If you find yourself inside a bureaucracy right now, be sure to pick up this book. You'll get a breadth of stories from what you heard today. Things like all the way back at Disney, at the NSA, in the field of medicine, and their stories of really how people did it. And so those true life stories are the ones that we can learn the most from. Eric and Chris, thank you so much for being on the show. We'll be sure to include links to Amazon and all the places to get it. Thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you for having (laughs) us. All right. Take care. Now you might be asking, Susan, why innovation storytelling? Well, the truth is that an innovation story told well not only breaks down communication barriers so you can drive change and new growth, but it also helps other people remember and champion your work. And it propels your best ideas forward faster to secure you the runway, resources, and recognition you so richly deserve. In other words, stories are memory-making devices that significantly reduce the time it takes for you and your innovation to be understood. But like many leaders, you probably never got the memo that storytelling skills would be central to your success. Well, I've got some good news for you. It's not too late because I've got you covered. Whether you need an expert to come and speak to your innovation leaders, you need training in the art and method of innovation storytelling, or you just need the support and guidance of a consultant who can get you where you want to go in less time, visit www.susanlinder.com today to learn more and to set up a call to discuss your needs. I'm so looking forward to connecting with you and to helping you tell a great innovation story. If you liked what you heard so far, 
Don't forget to subscribe so you never miss another episode. And leave us a comment. Tell us what you think of this episode. We'd love to hear from you. And if you didn't like what you've heard, just forget everything I've said.